Hey guys, Kidai Kino here, ushering in a new decade of kaiju films as Toho and especially Daie limp into the 70s, kneecapped by television but still hanging on. First up we have Gamera vs. Jiger, which combines the formula of the last two Gamera films with the shoot the rodeo opportunity of the Expo 70 World's Fair in Osaka, plus a Gappa-esque plot in which the Japanese take something sacred from a racially questionable depiction of a Pacific Island people and awaken a monster. Honestly, all those reused elements were done better in the previous films, and even though the premise is an interesting step back from two consecutive alien invasions, the only thing that's really all that interesting about this movie is the fantastic voyage bit with the kids going inside Gamera's body and finding the baby Jiger implanted in his lungs. That, and Gamera being incapacitated for a good chunk of the film by Quills impaling his arms and legs so he can't retract them and fly after Jiger. Children love seeing their heroes painfully rip arrows out of flesh wounds in their limbs, as everybody knows. Next up, there's Space Amoeba. This one's interesting, being the second original kaiju film to play in theaters as the main feature of the Toho Champion Festival, but not really being that clearly geared towards children. It's an Ishiro Honda film with a cast full of Toho veterans, including a very brief return to kaiju films by Yu Fujiki, and tonally it reminds me a good deal more of something like Atragon than its more fanciful Toho tokusatsu contemporaries, though there is an alien element. This isn't really one of Honda's elaborate blockbusters, though. It's very much a scaled-back island film like Jun Fukuda's two 60s Godzilla films, and while it does touch on Japan's presence in the Pacific during World War II, it doesn't really have that much to say about it. That said, it's interesting to see three new monsters created for this film based on actual Pacific marine life some of which almost seem influenced by the Gamera series. Gizora's execution is pretty similar to Virus, as opposed to previous tentacled monsters in Toho films, which were usually portrayed either by puppets or actual octopi. And then there's Kamebas, which pretty much speaks for itself. Space Amoeba is a neat little film, but no classic, and somewhat revealing of the state of affairs at Toho at the time, being their first kaiju film since the death of Eiji Tsuburaya, and Ishiro Honda's final film under his contract with the studio. Up next, there's the last gasp of the original Gamera series, Gamera vs. Zegra. Both Toho and Daie were in dire financial straits at the time. Toho abandoned many aspects of its almost old Hollywood studio business model after Space Amoeba, and established the subsidiary Toho Eizo to cut production costs by circumventing the labor unions. Daie barely managed to get Gamera vs. Zegra released, doing so through a partnership with Nikatsu called Dainichi Films that allowed the two studios to share the cost of distributing the films they produced. Honestly, as generous as I've been with these films, even I have to question whether it was really worth the trouble. This really is a low for the series. The child actors are pretty terrible, and it's fairly obvious a good deal of the funding must have come from some deal with SeaWorld, because most of the human plot takes place there. And they make sure to show off as much of it as they can as the mind-controlled astronaut ineptly chases the two child leads around the park at considerable length. I'll grant that even up to and including these last two films, the Gamera series always delivered some reasonably entertaining monster fights, but basically everything else about the series was suffering pretty terribly by the time it was finally put out of its misery by Daie's bankruptcy later that year. Somewhat poetically that, um, that bankruptcy would see existing uh, labor disputes at Daie escalate into full-scale riots that destroyed pretty much all of the Gamera series' props and models. But yeah, so Daie's dying, and while Toho's still around, they're in kind of a shambles. The old Toho basically is no more, and Ishiro Honda's been released from his contract, so for the next Godzilla film, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka gets a new guy named Yoshimitsu Bano to direct. Tanaka is then hospitalized during production, and what Bano makes is Godzilla vs. Hetera. There is honestly so much to talk about with this film. I'm kinda glad I didn't have a whole lot to say about the last few, 
because there is really a lot to unpack here. Just imagine being a young kaiju fan when this thing came out. For over a year, you've been subsisting on Champion Festival reissues, one okay Honda Island movie, and two pretty terrible Gamera films. Plus, Return of Ultraman just started airing within the last few months, and at the next Champion Festival, they debut this truly strange Godzilla film, featuring apocalyptic images of industrial pollution, graphic death, animated interludes, psychedelic aesthetics and music, and, yeah, Godzilla flying. It was honestly cold water to the face just watching it for the binge, like, at most a week and a half after all monsters attack. This movie is kinda known as the Godzilla movie about pollution, and I'll grant that that's kind of how it presents itself, but it seems a lot less interested in the issue itself and the causes of it than it is in the response to it on multiple levels of society. The civil authorities, the media, and the military repeatedly fail to take the emergence of Hedera seriously enough, early enough, predict and prepare for how the situation will develop, or mount an effective response. Even with a plan that would work, Dr. Yano's electrodes, they fail to get it up and running with Godzilla having to power them himself. And you might think a film so critical of the establishment would be more sympathetic in its portrayal of the youth and counterculture, but nope. The kids pay lip service to environmental issues and make apocalyptic proclamations while tripping and partying their way through the whole crisis, with the counterculture's main representative in the film dying uselessly at a live music bonfire on Mount Fuji. It's a scathing critique of pretty much anyone concerned with environmental issues, even if it doesn't make much of an argument of its own about those issues. God, the style of this thing, it's so free associative. The low budget is sidestepped somewhat by depicting wide social effects of Hedera's appearance in animated vignettes and fragmented TV-inspired visuals. Entire conversations play out over animations and astronomical paintings, and the audio and visuals are frequently subjective, including not just monster point-of-view shots, but segues freely into black and white, or into hallucinations or dreams, one of which is accompanied by a poem the child Ken writes for school. Not enough for you? You want imagery? You want motifs? Bono's got you. Damned if I know what it all means, but he's got you. There's loads of injured eyes in this thing, Hedera burns half of Dr. Yano's face, including one of his eyes, and later burns out one of Godzilla's eyes, Godzilla puts out one of Hedera's eyes in retaliation. Is it a metaphor for a more figurative blindness? No time to think about that, we've got a monster we see early on forming from the union of two microscopic organisms and undergoing rapid bodily transformations into a creature with distinctly yonic eyes, one from whose charred body Godzilla pulls what appear to be eggs, then destroys them, and which then seems to give birth to another creature like it. Is this about overpopulation destroying the environment? Is Godzilla vs. Hedera anti-natalist? And then it ends with Godzilla walking off, and then Hokusai's great wave. Why? Who knows? I fucking love it. This movie is wild. The last battle between Godzilla and Hedera is too long, but this movie is so unique and daring that it's still a must-see. Tanaka was furious when he got out of the uh, hospital, though, and saw the final product and promptly banned Bono from ever working on the Godzilla series again. And so next up is Godzilla vs. Gigan, with Jun Fukuda back in the director's chair and some very aggressive and noticeable cost-cutting measures in effect. There's a lot of recycled footage padding out the monster scenes, and a score assembled from existing recordings of compositions by Akira Ifukube. The latter works a lot better than the former. The Godzilla suit from Destroy All Monsters is now on its fourth film and in really rough shape. This is also the first Godzilla film produced by Toho Eizo, a company created by Toho to skirt union rules and produce films even more cheaply. All in all, I have to say, despite the cut corners, I find this one a pretty fun romp. There is a certain definite Champion Festival sensibility to it, it's a colorful film filled with comic motifs and fanciful imagery like the Godzilla Tower. Gigan is a pretty wild design. Hetero was too, but it made sense as a monster embodying industrial waste. Gigan's design has no such thematic dimensions as far as I can tell. It's just an alien bird with huge claws, 
one eye and a buzzsaw. I like the characters too, Gengo and the corn hippie are funny, Tomoko is rad, and Fumio and Kubota are good villains. The biggest issues for me are these. One, the incorporation of daytime stock footage into nighttime scenes doesn't really work all that well. And two, King Ghidorah is really lifeless in the new footage. Teruyoshi Nakano, the new special effects director, had clearly found his creative voice in terms of pyrotechnics, but was still seemingly getting the hang of monsters. His scenes in Hedera had been a little sluggish at times, but the issues with King Ghidorah are particularly accentuated by their juxtaposition with footage from previous films of a violent and energetic Ghidorah. In the end though, Gigan is a good time. And next time we'll see the original Godzilla series hang on for three more Champion Festival headliners, with Godzilla vs. Megalon vs. Mechagodzilla and Terror of Mechagodzilla. Meanwhile, Italian producer Dino De Laurentiis goes to Hollywood to produce a lavish remake of King Kong for Paramount, while Jack Harris goes to South Korea to beat De Laurentiis to theaters with the low-budget 3D epic Ape. Until then, thanks for watching, special thanks to my patrons, and extra special thanks to Exploder Button, John Pinier, and Ryan Clark. You can support my videos by becoming a patron at the link in the description, and I'll see you next time.